Welcome to the eighth episode of the Interstice podcast. We are back, finally. And I would like to talk about, to start with, why I've been away. I think that's important. Without making my life an open wound, I do like to be genuine and honest about what's occurring. I think the narrative of my life is why many people tune in, so I'd like to share that. Uh, whether you're listening on Apple iTunes or Spotify or here on the channel, thank you very much. Uh, if you would like to support me to allow perhaps one day for me to do this full time, please do consider supporting me on my Patreon. The link is down below in the video. It's Dave Trippin if you don't have that link description available to you. So let's get right into it. I'll tell you the format today. I thought I would talk about why it is that I've been away and then once we've done that, I can talk about the details. I think that'll extend well into some time. And then as I'd established before, because I want to get people interacting with me here, I'll be going over in detail in the second half of the podcast. I'm going to go through some emails and where I usually don't get them too long or allow for them to be too long an email. Even if they're a little bit long, we're, gonna, we're going to go down that path. And if you would like to have your emails answered on the podcast, please get a hold of me at DaveTrippinon at gmail.com. Again, that's down in the description of the video, or just listen to that little bit that I just said there one more time, DaveTrippinon at gmail.com. So why have I been away? Well, essentially, I have been looking for new work. I felt it had come time that with the position that I was at, as people know, I've been employed by a board of ed education here in Japan, and I've been with them for about four years. And I felt even with them, a kind of a definitive glass ceiling where I've been teaching in elementary school, which is good in terms of developing your experience where an elementary school in Japan is actually where if you're at an entry level or just starting, it's where you're going to actually teach the most. Because if you start in junior high school, most junior high schools here in Japan are very, very much the support position. But I love my school. The people there are absolutely wonderful. But I felt like I'd, I'd grown as much as I possibly could in that role where there's only so many times you can teach basic, basic grammar and however many activities. That's how you keep it fresh, right? With the activities that you're teaching. There's only so many activities that you have where it doesn't feel like you, it feels like you're repeating yourself. And so I went on a hunt and when you do a job hunt, as I go and I, I focus on that kind of thing, the amount of effort that I put into my channel, I wouldn't be able to do the two simultaneously. And so I think there is, for who I am, kind of a limited scope of effort that I can make. And I'm trying as best I can to put 100% effort into whatever I do. I think that's another element of it. I could have been putting out maybe more casual videos, but if I do put a video out, at the very least, I want to put some forethought into it. I want to develop an idea and have something really to say uh, or to care about when I make it. So it was important to me that I focus on one thing at a time. And I have some really exciting news, which now allows me to then continue on <laughs> uh, to, uh, to now kind of elaborate and have more interesting things to talk about. And that is that I managed to find a new job. And it's really, really interesting to me, uh, and I specifically chose it as the one that I most desired for the fact that it is a private school. And not only is it a private school, but it is a junior, senior high school. And this for me is incredibly similar to what I experienced when I was younger, where the school that I went to for high school and a kind of junior middle, yeah, like junior high school experience was a private school. It was international and it was boarding. I was local. If you watch my earlier podcasts, you know this. Uh, I was not boarding. I was local to the area that they had it. And it was one of the most formative experiences in my life. The, the values that the school had for education, 
uh, the, the sports that I did there, which allowed me to travel, uh, the emphasis on an international community was amazing. And when I looked around at all these different jobs, this school, when I read through the principal's message, uh, they had this page dedicated to the values that they had, the emphasis that they were putting on how being a more internationally minded person can really help you create a purpose for yourself. Who's to say what ultimately nothing matters. <laughs> 2020 has started out pretty rough. Um, but we create purpose for ourselves and that allows us to continue forward positively, to be a positively contributing, contributing member of a community. And I saw here at this school kind of similar values to what I saw when I was in high school. And I always thought when I compared all the different, ex different experiences that I had, unquestionably, it was a su superior experience that I had at that high school. There were great teachers here and there. When I was in middle school, I had this incredible rugby coach, a good homeroom teacher. But yes, the high school experience was amazing. And there are elements that you cannot simply ignore about private schools, which, especially for a teacher, can make them a more desirable environment to work in. And some of these reasons are what I am so excited about. So we'll, we'll touch we'll touch on a bunch of stuff here. I want to share with you guys the I the all without obviously for professional and privacy reasons, I'm not going to say the name of the school, but I can actually in great detail while still respecting professionalism and privacy, talk about it. And what I'm really excited about. Well, OK, here's one thing. So in the position that I'm in now, you are, even as an elementary school where I design everything and I lead everything, you don't have a teacher's license and you're considered an AET, an assistant English teacher, even though you're not assisting at all, you're leading and doing everything, which I think is actually somewhat of an issue in the public school system that elementary school foreign teachers don't have the recognition for the fact that they're doing essentially a full-time teacher's job. Aside from the school club activities, there's more time. Let's uh, let's be fair to the Japanese teachers here. The amount of time spent, certainly they're putting in more. But in terms of when a class starts and what you do as a teacher there, you're no longer an assistant. So how does this relate to the school, which uh, I'll now be moving to? Well, I will be a full I will be a full member of staff at this school. You are considered that. And since you are considered that, you are to teach lessons by yourself. And if you're going to teach lessons by yourself, then you will require a teacher's license. So this school will actually sponsor a proper Japanese teaching license for me. So mo no more of this designation as an assistant teacher. I will be a full licensed teacher here in Japan, which is a wonderful feeling. And with that, I mean, really, that's just a piece of paper. But what what does it mean for my day to day? It means that there is no one that need watch over me while I teach these lessons. And because I taught in the elementary school setting, I feel totally comfortable with that. It actually would not matter aside from the very best teachers aside from the very best, because there are a few Japanese teachers that really do make a difference when they're there. Aside from those, it really wouldn't matter if the Japanese teacher was there or not. I would be leading the lesson and it would, yeah, there's no impact. If they're exceptional, sure. Next to that, the classes that I have at the school that I'm at now, again, the, the things that I might may draw a comparison with and say are more positive in the private school. I do want to coach this in the unsexy uh, language of giving everything its fair due. It's a public school. They're not obviously going to have the same funding. And the thing that I'm going to talk on now is class sizes. Of course, the class sizes are much, much larger in the school that I'm in now. So for example, probably the smallest class that I would teach would be about 23 students. That's the smallest class that I would teach. But if you are going to teach at this new school, I think they're a little bit exceptional. I think this is because they put a particularly strong focus on English. The class sizes that I am expected to have are between 10 to 15 students. 
and that is profoundly impactful. The, the ability to focus on uh, the individual needs of a student is obviously very, very important. And when you get to a class size of something like I've experienced uh, upwards of 40, it's difficult to zero in on every single student. I mean, when you thought, if you thought about it in this way, that if I spent one minute directly focusing on the needs of an individual student in a 40, uh, 40 uh, student class, they would get a minute each. <laughs> it's not that much. And the classes in elementary school are 45 minutes. So you can understand how I am very, very excited for the fact that they would have at this school much smaller class sizes. So some, that's something that I'm really, really, really looking forward to. Now, aside from that, what are other reasons that I'm excited? Well, I'll, I, I wouldn't say obviously exactly where I am, but I can say that I'm moving closer to Tokyo. Now, the beautiful sweet spot of this, this, is, this can kind of touch on the topic of rent and uh, what, you, what you're getting when you live in Tokyo uh, versus if you live outside of it. So I live truly truly in a very, 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 very small town currently. And in this small town, something like cost of living is fantastic. And the reason that you're getting that is that you're living very, very far out of the way. Now, I am going to move closer to Tokyo. And what that means is that you would expect that the cost of living good would go up, but not really. The the cost of living is going to actually remain the same. And the beauty of this is, is that I will be in much more. It's essentially it's a city. It's not a big, big city, uh, but it's significant in size. And if I draw any direct comparison to say something, for example, that you might find in Canada, you'd be like, oh, that's a pretty big city. And for that reason, where now I have to commute 40 minutes to get to my uh, my gym, I will be with uh, at the houses that I was looking at and planning for, uh, I would be about 10 minutes away. And the same is true of the onsen that I would go to now. That onsen is about 40 minutes away. Now it's going to be 10 minutes away. The Where I would go to a movie theater, that was about 30. Now it's 10. Basically, where all my commute distances were anywhere between 30 to 50 minutes, they've now dropped down to about 10 minutes. And the, uh, the peak of my happiness regarding this is that, like I say, even though I'm closer to Tokyo, because I'm not yet really close to Tokyo, I'm still going to be about an hour and a half away if you didn't take an express, but I believe about an hour away if you took an express. My cost of living is still going to be the same. So actually, when I looked around at all the different rental prices that I was finding, they were fantastic. They're they're roughly equivalent to what I have now. And I'm looking forward to an apartment which will be it's going to be bigger because I've wanted to had I've wanted to have a dedicated room to be able to do this, to be able to do the things that I do creatively to kind of make it like a little mini studio. Um, so it will be bigger and it will be a little bit more expensive, but not by much, because I've I've specifically cited out that this is the thing that I want to more be able to do the sort of creative stuff that I love. And it's cool too. I'm obviously going to do a an apartment tour when I get there because that's like catnip to the internet and I enjoy making them because it's very, very exciting for me to be, be living in a new place. Uh, one of the cool things about this, where I live now, I'm in 52 square meters. It's a single floor. I'm on the second floor. There's somebody who lives above me. They've been great, by the way. I have fantastic, uh, wonderful, not that I ever talked to them. I've been wonderful in the way that they seem to be not there. They're very quiet, very respectful, and I've had some crazy ones. The people who lived up there before them, they had kids, and in a space so small, you wouldn't think that they would uh, run from end to end so constantly, but they certainly did. They achieved some truly amazing things there with the limited space they had. This new place that I'm getting, uh, the one that I've, if I get it, I'm quite certain that I can, 
it's a terraced house. And as I've understood this to mean in rental terms in Japan, it's that you essentially get two stories if you get one of these. And I love it because the, the way that it's situated now for me is that my, my living room is also essentially my office for working on any sort of creative stuff that I'm doing where this design is going to have the entrance, the bottom floor is going to be the living room and the kitchen. Awesome. And because I'm going to dedicate the space to just that, it's going to feel like more space. And then when you go upstairs, which is what you would do, you will find the uh, the like the master bedroom, the main bedroom, and then another bedroom. It's a 2LDK. That's the Japanese uh, description of it. So obviously I'm going to have the one bedroom for the sleeping. And then in the other bedroom, I'm going to set up all things creative, YouTube, videography, photography, studio for doing the, the podcast, which is really, really exciting. I, uh, I'm a man who enjoys adventure and what, uh, what's more adventurous than switching where you spend most of your waking hours. So that's really, really exciting. And a part of the whole experience of going out, uh, going to this new city, uh, as well as the moving closer to all the things that are important to my life. Uh, so it's going to be really, really exciting. And I could tell when I went into this place that there was such a passion. Here's another fascinating characteristic of working at this place and the sort of emphasis that they have as well on English. There is Direct hires in my current board of education, I believe there's 10 spaces, and then they have, in addition to that, eight jets from the jet government program. So 18 in total. That is then spread across this entire board of education. And so however many schools that is, it's a lot. I mean, they make the effort here to have a single teacher dedicated to each school. So it's like 18 schools. There are, so there you go, 18 teachers, 18 schools, and then we'll, we will occasionally visit other schools. I do that. I occasionally visit other schools um, once a week, twice a week kind of thing. Um, this school, the new school in which I will be employed, it has eight English teachers <laughs> dedicated to one school. Now, it is a junior and senior high school paired together so that there is that fact there is this element that it is larger grades whatever you would say like uh, six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve it's got six grades i believe six years that's their program and so it's a little larger and you'd want maybe more than one english teacher but the fact that they have eight is really, really, really impressive and shows a commitment to actually making more than a lip service improvement to their students there, which I thought was really, really cool. Uh, now, everybody knows on the channel, I would think by now, I've talked about it enough that uh, I am as well at this time working on uh, software engineering, which I that's that's not been abandoned. That's something I will continue to work on, absolutely. But I think that we are most productive when I was talking earlier about purpose, when we feel like when we get up in the morning, all elements of our life align. And I actually think that the software engineering will go better for the fact that I will derive more satisfaction in the day job that I'm working. And I'd like to think as well also for the creative things that I'm doing. When you're happier, you're more productive. And I think as well, something that's going to be really, really cool is also exploring this new city and this new area. I know that when I used to live in Chiba Prefecture and I lived in Sanmu, I loved walking around there and doing these videos. And they were always walk and talk videos, not with a gimbal, a little better now that I got the gimbal and I'm not recording on a phone and on a A6500. Um, but I'll have that again. I think to to be revitalized in that way for me, it suits my personality. I um, I don't mind having a place where I feel more settled, but I am at my best when I feel like life is new and exciting, and I'm pursuing things that like light up my brain. And I, I really do feel with this uh, change that's occurred now that that's going to more be the state of my mind.
totally grateful for the position that I had here. And the people that I most immediately interacted with were wonderful people. I made some great friendships as well, like people I would never forget, people I would never take the time that I spent with for granted. Uh, but I'm also a person, I've been of the mind that that phrase, and I have I have science to back this up, that idea that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, is it's actually crazy relating to neuroplasticity. And something else that suits my personality is I never feel like I've met all my best friends and I'm not the sort of person as well who's searching out endless, endless acquaintances. I don't need a massive group of people around me uh, to have vapid, not so exciting um, friendships. I want to meet a never ending line of people who I consider like family. And that has continued through my whole life. Every new place that I have gone to, uh, there's been several people uh, that I've been able to connect with. And life is unimaginable without their companionship. And when you do something like this, when you change where you live, inevitably, you're put in contact with more and more and more people. And there is then potential again to meet more people that could have these greater depth of a relationship sort of type people. You can meet them. And I'm really looking forward to that as well. I'm always so curious about who's around the next corner in my life that uh, I'll connect with and that will have something to teach me that I can teach them. There's, uh, I'm very fond of this expression, it's mine. I was thinking at our best, uh, as humans, we, we kind of, we fall into three archetypes and it's um, mentor, student, creator. And I like meeting all those personality types. It, it could be a creator and then you, you totally connect with them in, in however it is that they create. You could meet a student. This is a person that is a friendship where you have so much uh, to, to teach them or that they can teach you. And this is literally, I mean, in a kind of uh, academic sense. And then there's a mentor uh, where the kind of the delineation there between the mentor and the student kind of relationships that you have is they're, they're more based in wisdom where somebody can teach you how to solve a math problem or to uh, play a guitar, but questions of wisdom, how to live your life, how to, how to live morally, um, what, is going to, what is going to keep you with a direction, uh, what is going to allow you to find purpose, I suppose, find purpose and balance, I guess you might say. Um, those are the other types of people. So these these mentors, these teachers, these creators, I want to meet more of them. I don't, some people, I get it. They, they, they're satisfied and they say, I don't need any more good friends, but I don't see why that would ever stop. I, uh, I love meeting new, truly good people. That will, that will never end in my life. And I think that that's going to happen here. Um, and as I say, in fact, I'm, I'm certain it will because as much as life is always new, life is always the same. And I've seen repeated patterns, certainly scale changes. But then if you look, if scale is relative, it's always kind of, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> life, life is endlessly repeating itself. You can have new experiences, but they're, they're kind of like a variation, I think, past a certain point of what you already know. And I have nothing against that. I think it's kind of like um, this fascinating thing, like the comparison you could make would be to music where music exists in a continuum. All scales start at whatever note and then reach a whatever uh, next, uh, the next octave and then they repeat. And so you might think that that would be boring, but it's the way that you interact with those notes with, with timing and octave that allows for infinite, um, what would you call manifestations, even though it seemingly is the same thing. So 
when I've seen that that's such an incredible part of life is connecting with people and creating deep, meaningful relationships, you betcha it's something that I'm, I'm always going to pursue. So that concludes the first half. And now we're going to get into what is now <laughs> been a, a decent buildup of um, the emails that we have sent to the channel. And we're going to answer some very Japan centric questions separate from me finding this new job. Okay, so as promised, let's dive right into the emails. And I'm going to be as I say thorough this time because I'd like to I'd like to actually really dig in regardless of the length. Uh, so to show how much I appreciate when people write me. So hi, Dave, I get to the point in about the fifth paragraph. <laughs> Um, my question is, I'm jumping that far ahead because he suggests to do so. What is the perception of age of teachers there? Would you happen to know anyone who comes from Thailand to work in Japan? It seems to me most ESL teaching cultures are quite similar, avoiding confrontation and not being told things until the last minute. <laughs> Apathetic students. I'm worried that I'm too old. And I think this gentleman was 44 there is um, there is a degree of ageism in Japan that I think it becomes more difficult for you the older that you are. That's that's the cold truth of it. Um, and I do find that these things regarding not being told to the last minute and uh, apathetic students, I think that th this is all true, but I feel like these are a situation that occurs because not that it has to be that way, but that so often there are circumstances that allow for that. But I really do feel that if you make an effort, if you learn the language better, um, you'll if you if you can reach some students, some students, I mean, a lot of students, in my opinion, are only apathetic because they have never seen anything worth paying attention to. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't truly apathetic students and that's simply the way they are and that you won't reach through to them. I have students like that. I have students and I don't fault them for it because they're young. What are you faulting them for? That they have no interest and they are as opposed as you could possibly imagine to your class. And it's how the universe is going to work at that time. That's the, the most important thing I would say in that case with that situation is to not take things personally. Uh, that's where it still starts to really derail if you if you take those kind of things personally. All right, so let's let's move along. Okay, moving, moving, moving. Simply says, can you help me? I was hoping you could help me. I'm a high school student that plans to move out to Japan after high school to become a chef. Ooh. I was wanting to know if you could give me a second opinion on a good place that's not crowded in Japan. I'm having a hard time trying to find somewhere. If you can help me, that's fine. I'm glad that that's fine. So this, this kind of situation, wanting to be a chef, there's, you could find your way in on like a travel, like a work, like work holiday, travel visa. That's how you could make this work and then potentially get a business to then continue to sponsor your visa where you had moved into the kitchen. But if you came over, not as like a member of serving staff, oh, I think that would be a little bit tough. I've never done the hospitality industry thing, so I'm not sure what people are usually going in for. You can imagine that unless you had like half decent Japanese, that would be pretty tough. Like if you're working as a international staff at a bar that's mostly got foreigners coming into it, it's not such an issue. And even if you're speaking Japanese, you're speaking sort of like service industry Japanese, so it's fine. <clears throat> I would say working holiday visa, get into one of these restaurants, and then if your skill set is that you are a chef, then try and continue through that sponsorship to, to keep getting on. Okay, let's continue. That was a fun one. All right. Okay, jumping up ahead. Okay, there we are. Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is, yeah, I see these are around the time that I, I started looking for work. So it's why I kind of dropped off the face of the planet. Okay, uh, this one says, good evening, Dave. 
or perhaps it's uh, morning in Japan. I just recently came across your YouTube titled Things I'd Wish I'd Known Before Teaching in Japan, where you discuss the importance of looking for other work soon after arriving and living in Japan, highlighting the fact that being in the country is arguably the most important factor when looking for higher pay and self-development with a teaching career. That video is a few years old now, so my question is, do you think that what you highlighted in the video is just as important today, or has the landscape in teaching in Japan changed to where your advice now might be different? Uh, thanks for providing the email and guidance. All right, that is a worthy question because I, I think as someone who creates and uploads videos on YouTube, we will kind of indiscriminately choose a stance which supports us at that time. So what I mean to say is if something, if somebody said something bad in the past, then they, they might easily say, well, I mean, you can't take me to task on everything I said because it was like 10, 20 years ago. But then just as much somebody else might say, if they liked the response that somebody had to what they'd created, they'll say, oh, well, of course, that's always how I felt. It's, uh, it's an immutable fact of life. Seems funny to me. Truth is, both are fair. It, it just depends, but it does make me laugh. But in the case of this video where I'm talking about how it's really, really important to essentially be in Japan uh, and to very quickly, if you've come through one of these foot in the door companies to look for something better, that has remained true now and is now just as true as it was the however many years ago that I had created that video. It is important all, I mean, if I think about it in this sense that all these companies that I had mentioned, all those companies, well, they're, they're all here. They're all here, and as far as I can tell, uh, the ways in which they conduct themselves have not changed. If anything, they've increased the tactics that they use to have great churn, great turnover in their staff, uh, not pay for health insurance, things like that. Um, so ever and always, once you get here, that's something that really aids you. And once you've gotten a foot in the door company, then you're going to want to look, look for something better. Absolutely. And I would also then add on to this that I really do believe, and I've tried to live this, not just tell people this, that not only should you look for something better, but do things also to improve your ability. Like I know a guy in Osaka right now. He's actually, um, he's a subscriber, but it was really, really cool because just with some subscribers, I, sp I speak to you guys. And like I said, I'm, I'm interested in getting to know people on a deeper level. And if somebody's not crazy and we end up striking up an interesting conversation, uh, then I end up becoming friends. And this guy I consider a very good friend. He's... Um, He's really monetarily savvy and like business, uh, like labor code savvy because very independent person. Long story short, while he has been here, he's looked to elevate himself kind of, I don't know as directly per the suggestions that I've given, but he got a better direct hire position while he's been at that direct hire position. He is, um, what was I going to say? He's doing... I can't remember the name of the course that he's doing, but he's doing another course to increase his hireability in terms of teaching. Interestingly enough, he used to actually be in the IT background, but he, he likes the teaching and he's found a seemingly stable gig and the man seems to like stability. Um, but to be improving some other part of yourself while at the same time working is I think very important because certainly uh, if you're in a half decent teaching job, then you're probably improving your skill set. But if you're in your bog standard shadowing role as a junior high school ALT, you're not becoming a much better teacher. That's cold, that's harsh, but it's true. And I don't say it with judgment because you could be doing that while simultaneously doing other things to improve yourself. But I think you would be fooling yourself if you thought that by being a shadowing support ALT at junior high school, except for the rarest of circumstances, that you're really improving yourself as a teacher. So if you get a TESOL, if you, I mean, there's a number of educational programs that you can do to make yourself a better teacher. So do that while you're doing these other things. And that's really, really good. 
So thanks very much. We'll say Mark, no last name, so I'll say Mark. That was from Mark. Good to hear from you, Mark. Okay, next up we got Chili Willy. Fantastic. I don't think I've given away any names there. Doesn't look like this is going to be too Japan-centric, though, but that's okay. I like answering the emails. Uh, I used to watch... I used to watch a few years ago. Used to. But I lived in Japan about as long as you, so I could pretty much know already about many of the topics you discuss. Fair enough. I did see one more recent video that I enjoyed, and it was about your date with the divorcee and how she talked about her ex-husband way too much. Funny. Yeah, it was, I was riffing on a little... I've, I've loved the idea of stand-up, and that was my, my stand-up endeavor here behind the camera, though. Um, at any rate, I'll keep this short, as you're a big YouTube star. That's the best joke of the email. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, you did some videos talking and walking around the town, and it looks like you used a selfie stick. Maybe? What was your equipment? Selfie stick and a smartphone, a GoPro? I want to make some walking, talking videos as I'm going to Shikoko Henro next month. What camera equipment would you recommend? If you don't want to break the bank, it's actually incredible the sort of um, well, image stabilization that's built into cameras. I discovered that when I moved to like a proper camera, how, and the camera that I use has IBIS, like in-body image stabilization, I think probably to do with something how far out your lens is from the actual body and the, the issues that that creates. But if you're looking, I would say, honestly, use a cell phone and a selfie stick if you want to do walk and talk videos and do it casually because to go with the setup that I have now is thousands of dollars. And that would be absolutely absurd <laughs> to recommend to somebody who just makes a casual walk and talk. I may only be making one YouTube video just for my friends and family. Yeah, so all that you would want to do, it's a selfie stick, man. Use the selfie stick. You don't need anything more than that, and you're in great shape. Uh, GoPros also, they're nothing near as much as what I'm discussing again with like the Sony series or a gimbal. And they're, they're specifically built to have great image stabilization. So if you want a little better, better image quality, but you don't want to bust the bank, then that's another option that you have because everybody's doing like action sports. It's attached to their head. It's moving all the time. So they anticipated that they needed better image image stabilization. So they're really, really good for that. All right, let's, uh, let's move on up here. Okay. Stephen Thomas isn't waiting a response on LinkedIn. Well, we'll probably get to him at some point here. Okay. So it looks like I thought I had far more emails built up than that. I haven't, but that doesn't mean that we can't continue. So let's talk a little bit more about what's going on here on the channel. I want to keep people informed of that. So another reason that things haven't gone live on the channel is it's not only that I was looking for a job. This will sound kind of crazy, but... It's also because I've been working on the channel. And what I mean to say is that over the winter holidays, I'd gone to I'd gone to Tokyo. And in Tokyo for two days, I went out filming for two straight days. And I've tried to theorize what might be interesting for the channel, but still have mass appeal. How can I keep that artistic integrity while at the same time bringing something to you guys, which would be cool. And so I'm going to do, I'm working on, I've put probably around like 20, 30 hours into it now. Um, nah, let's not exaggerate. Probably around 20. Um, into a new video that's going to be all these different neighborhoods, which are my favorite. Um, and that will be coming out following this podcast. Um, in addition to that, really, really cool is my good friend Drew. He has this... Um, housing real estate development that's going up in Kyoto. He works very closely with Machia. And Machia are these traditional uh, buildings, the traditional buildings that you most often find in Kyoto. You can find them in other areas of Japan, but they're really iconic there. Perhaps one of the significant reasons, and I know, I know this from actual research, is that Kyoto in the Second World War was specifically avoided as a kind of cultural monument of the country that they weren't going to nuke it. And so um, what has had to have been rebuilt there are from like ancient fires that occurred. And 
a lot of the architecture that was there before was never destroyed because of any kind of war. Uh, and so you get these beautiful, traditional old buildings that often a feature I enjoy so much of is the interior garden. And it's maybe not always like the Western mind might assume a garden is like they'll often be rock gardens. But something that I really learned from seeing them more, and it's something I think we appreciate when we're out in nature, but we're never making these mental notes when we're in kind of experiential mode, is that something even so simple as a rock garden looks so different depending on the elements and a lot to do with rain and water. So of course, when rocks are wet, they take on this totally different look and color and hue. And when it's raining, if it's a light rain to see them kind of like with scattered, um, you know, like somebody took a paintbrush and just, whoosh, you know, like, uh, you know, just uh, what it was this called spots, just spots of rain. It looks really beautiful. And then maybe it'll have a single tree in it. And that single tree might be a leafed tree. And so when the leaves fall down into the rock garden, it looks really beautiful. Um, and they're, they're kind of like great utility buildings too. They tell such a story. I have a whole documentary dedicated to this. One of the, I would say one of the highlights of my YouTube career was a real estate company, Hachise Real Estate. If you want to see some of these beautiful machias, go to their website. They had me come down because they wanted me to do a presentation, a documentary on the machia. And so I did. And I learned so much. I knew that I already liked them. But this is a very roundabout way to say that come February, it was the plan. Drew's got this machia, these traditional buildings that he's restoring and he's turning into a kind of like a business co-op sort of thing, a creative space. And he would like me to come down in February and we are going to, I know what fan, you know, what, what great fans the internet are of house tours. Well, I'm going to try and do basically a business tour. We might call it a house tour, though, a restored house tour or something in the title just to attract people in. Uh, <laughs> you know, reasonable tactics, not clickbait, just drawing in the audience. And it's so beautiful there. So I'm probably uh, mid-February going to be heading down there and recording. And I'm really, really looking forward to that because night and day when I went in and you saw these like dilapidated, basically, I don't know that they were yet abandoned. They may have been, but to see the work, Drew also knows this um, master gardener. He actually, Drew and the master gardener, Tomosan, is it Tomosan, um, actually have a conversation in the documentary about the gardens at one of the machia that we go to visit and how having like a, a vegetable garden, because that was the variation in this particular house was that where some of them are rock gardens, the interior garden in this house particularly that we visited was a vegetable garden. And Drew had wondered if that was a little bit unusual. And the master gardener was saying, actually, no, because if you thought, of course, uh, when these buildings were first going up, access to the sort of general amenities that we have now was certainly not the case. And so to have something like your own personal uh, garden made a lot of sense because you weren't going to go out shopping, you were going to grow something, and then that's what you would eat for dinner. So it was um, really, really cool, the many, many different designs that they have there. And the, the number one feature, I'm curious how it will look when I go there to, it's called the Garden Lab. M maybe I could even put the link, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe I could put the link to, um, to, to his website uh, here. The main feature uh, is this beautiful, the Japanese have maple trees, but if you've been to Japan or you've seen pictures of this, the thing that kind of makes a Japanese maple unique is that they're little tiny maple leaves, little tiny momiji, that's the name of them. And there's one of these, it's beautiful. It's like, uh, you know, like uh, pulled from the ground. I'm trying to imagine, you know, meringue pie, like uh, when you whip up eggs and you kind of beat them and then they form peaks very easily. I notice when I look at some of these trees, a sort of like similar structure, like 
earth had been whipped up in such a way that now it was like a cream and then it's like grown out and frozen out of the ground in that same shape like meringue was pulled up out of a bowl or something and it's this beautifully shaped tree with all these beautiful leaves and when it changes it doesn't all change at once you can kind of see the creep of the season spread through the leaves over time and the months uh, as they go on whether it's uh, you know spring fall winter summer and it's especially beautiful and the design of this garden lab is to have a courtyard and it's in that courtyard that the uh, the momiji the um, the maple tree is growing and so all of the machia look inwards there's four of them and they all look inwards to this tree and there's been beautiful stonework done around the tree and oh it's exceptional and when I, when I think of where is it that you want to spend your time where is it that you want to work uh, I wouldn't there's no other place I would choose in the entire world for the sort of energy the the kind of sacred space that this uh, tree and the architecture of the buildings create surrounding it it's it's a really 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 special place so there is always a lot going on it's kind of interesting it seems like there there may not have been there <laughs> for a while because I was away dealing with this uh, intensely important life stuff but um, I do want to say that uh, like I mentioned as I was answering these emails here and hopefully now that I'm back active again on the channel uh, if you would like to get your questions answered please do write to me at davetrippinon at gmail.com Please do consider supporting the channel on my Patreon because that's what one day allows this to go live and that would be amazing because the more time that I have free to dedicate, it, dedicate to it, obviously there is a limit while working uh, a full-time job, the, how ambitious I can be in the scale of things for pure hours in the day. It's that classic problem of there's just not enough of them with the uh, the limited energy and time that we have um, finish up here talking a little bit more about the location why I like it this uh, new school that I'll be going to is that it's also near it has this park that is directly adjacent to a quite large body of water and for a guy who grew up on an island and now has chosen an island country to live on water is quite important to me as is green as are green things and so uh, that's that's going to be really really wonderful the um the couple of books that i'm reading right now actually let's finish up that final thing uh, i'm reading small gods by terry pratchett but then following that it's going to be why we age and why we don't have to and then the salvation sequence by peter f hamilton the second in the series of books from his new universe that he's just recently created he has two universes this i believe is now the third universe that he's uh expanded out expanded outwards into all right uh that's gonna be it for the eighth episode ah one last thing hopefully people didn't click off there this is important because i keep mentioning uh patreon and this is something that i will be doing before I will have this up and running and episodes up and running before the end of February I'm going to pay for a second a second podcast to be able to be active at the same time as I'm doing this podcast and that podcast will be dedicated to the people who support me on patreon and the content there I think is going to be a lot of fun because it'll be completely unhinged from the totally Japanese centric stuff that I try to do here. I love Japan. This is a Japan centric podcast, but if uh, you're going to listen there, you'll hear about everything because of course my, my uh, interests are far and wide ranging. So it's going to be movies, comics, uh, anything, whatever, whatsoever under the sun. And I'm hoping that that'll be just one more way than I, that I can say thank you to you lovely people who support me there. But that's it for now. If you're on the channel, please do uh, leave a like. Uh, if you had fun here, want to catch some more, subscribe so you get notified up to the moment that it is uh, released on the channel. For those of you listening elsewhere, thank you so much for supporting my work. I really, really appreciate it. Um, 
considering maybe in April going to one of these Hanami things if enough people say that they'd like to say hello to me there. Uh, but for now, the clock has run out. Thanks for listening. I appreciate you people, you lovely ladies and gentlemen. Until the next podcast, until the next video, that's all for now.